you know, these are just crazy South American countries. It never happened here in the United States, right? Because we're Americans, right? We, not, we always win in the end. Well, until the Republicans took over in 2010 the Congress, the Democrats were kicking this around. So, go, you know, and look, I guess I'm an evil libertarian and I'm not whatever fascist and I'm by. Look it up! Go, I'm not, you know, I'm an economist first and foremost, so I like, I like having data and statistics and reality, then I form my ideology. I don't say, well, I'm a libertarian and I'm going to try and fit everything to make it look like I'm right. That's, you know, so, you know, be very well aware of that risk out there. In short, for you guys, don't invest in a 401k or an IRA until there's a balanced budget, which means never. And then prepare to work till you're dead, and that's a dead little animal. In case you didn't know. Now, the economic ramifications of all this economic stuff, what are we looking at here? Well, you're really looking at the future viability of the United States call it being called into question, or have people's faith and trust that the United States is going to be a fair and viable economic entity in the future. Because if I can't trust my 401k not being confiscated, I'm not invested. And if you have to worry about, oh, let's say you're a Halliburton or something, and you have a lot of supplies ready to go on the Keystone uh, uh, pipeline, well, somebody comes in and arbitrarily shuts it down because of environmental concerns. You really, you have to have stability, a guarantee in the future that you're not going to have your assets confiscated, that yes, we're going to have the permits and everything else. Well, if you don't, if that looks less and less certain, then people invest less and less. There's trillions of dollars of capital. Corporations and foreign companies and foreign governments have trillions of dollars in capital and money they would like to invest. But since it's such an uncertain environment, they're holding back. So, <clears throat> This is driving away investment entrepreneurship, and when that happens, what happens to your economy? Unemployment rates. Okay. Here we have the Volcker recession. I remember that. That was during the Atari 2600 days. Those were good days. Uh, but here's the environment that you guys are facing. Notice the sharp decline, though. Here it's been very stubborn, but now it's finally going down. We're down at only 8.2%. My favorite was when they were ripping George Bush apart when he peaked out at 6.2, saying that was the worst economy in 50 years. But now, 8.2 is the new 6.2, and we're very happy about it. It's like Sarah Jessica Parker thinking, oh, 53 is the new 32. Like, no, just keep lying to yourself. So, uh, you see that there. Are you going to face this unemployment market? No. You guys are not experienced. Yeah, I know you have some experience, you're gonna, you have no experience. You're gonna face the underemployment rate. This includes uh, people who are not only unemployed, but working part-time, working a, or working a job that does not realize their full potential. So uh, how many of you are working like a typical college job? Yeah. Okay, you're not engineers or scientists or accountants yet, yeah, right? Just, what do you do? I work at a school. A school? After school program. Okay, so if three years from now you graduate, you're still working at that school program, you'd be considered a, but for now you're not. But when you enter the market, realize there's a lot of people my age and older who have more years experience than you do, and we're likely to get hired over you because there's so much unemployment. So unfortunately, you guys face the problem. You're going into a market that's not just flooded with graduates your age, you're flooded, you're going into a market that is flooded with people my age with years of experience on top of that. So that's another uphill battle that you guys unfortunately are going to have. Making things worse, that previous chart is regardless of age. This is the youth unemployment. It is more akin to about, I'd say, 18% because they're only doing it annually, not uh, monthly. Um, so I apologize for the choppiness of the chart. But you're looking at more of like a high teens unemployment rate that you're going into when you're in this labor market. So it, it's, you know, but that is again because of all the debt. Also, economic consequence, here's what's called the labor force participation rate. Don't worry about why it's volatile, that's a seasonality, like summer, winter, uh, you know, construction, tourism. So kind of take the, the general average there. What we see since this recession hit is a drop in the labor force participation rate. Now what a lot of people don't know is the difference between the unemployment rate and the labor force participation rate. The unemployment rate is not, it is not the percent of the population that is not working. Our unemployment rate is 8.2%. That doesn't mean 8.2% of the 3 million people are out of work because two large segments of the population don't work. Kids 
and retirees. So what we do with the labor force participation rate, this is the percentage of people that can work that actually are working and looking for work. So it's gone up. You see out of the, back in the 50s and the 60s, who was missing here? Who wasn't participating? Women. Women, yeah. They're staying at home primarily in the 50s. And then women are in the labor force. You see the big rise. And now we see a 4% drop here because people are getting discouraged. This is not because everyone won the lottery and says, hey, I'm never working no more. I mean, this is because people keep looking, looking, looking. And if you don't find a certain job after a certain amount of time, you are no longer considered part of the labor force. So if you take that 4% decline added to the official 8.2% unemployment rate, uh, you're looking at a, an effective rate of about 12%, assuming the uh, labor force participation rates stay the same. So again, not terribly good there. Also, we have our decaying economic growth, those previous aforementioned uh, economic factors. And with GDP growth slowing, this is the most important data statistic uh, in all of economics. It's real GDP per capita, or otherwise income per capita, okay, adjusted for inflation. So we see it's been going up, but this, and I know to the untrained eye, it may not seem like a lot, but if you notice, every recession we have, it's like blip, zoom, blip, zoom, blip, zoom, and it makes things more exciting to make sound effects when you're teaching economics. Uh, but here, it's just blip, and then we really haven't had that great recovery that you normally do. So, and we take calculus. Derivatives, okay, so you, I, I'm not going to pull a, a derivative or integral calculus here, but I'm going to do something similar that we did with uh, GDP growth. We're going to do a 10-year average to see what's the general trend, what's the rate of the, the change here. Uh, you see this, so this goes back 1939 to 1929. So to translate the chart, we had the Great Depression. We went from zero to World War II, we we're just going gangbusters in terms of economic production. Uh, we killed Hitler, or the <laughs> Russians did, and then everyone comes home. So this isn't a bad thing necessarily, we're just scaling down the war at that time. And then we have a pretty good increase in standards of living, except for your generation. The past 10 years have been the worst since this data has been recorded, uh, except for when we, we scaled down in World War II. So your standards of living are growing at less than a 1% rate of return. And that's what you also have experienced because this is the past 10 years, right? So now hopefully things will pick up, but again, it's not a really good economic environment you're going into. Naturally, our rankings have, across the world have gone down. We used to be number one, except for places like Liechtenstein, where they make 141,000 a year because they're all Liechtensteinians and, and speaking German and making really fancy clocks. Uh, anyone know about Liechtenstein? No. It's a veritable kingdom. There, it's like a kingdom, and that's why they're rich. Uh, but anyway, we're eighth, seventh, seventh, depending on which one you want to use and measure. A lot of uh, other countries are now starting to beat us. And it's not your oil rich uh, countries, just like, I mean, you got Hong Kong beating us, Bermuda, the Cayman Islands, places like that. Right. Ultimately, never has a generation in the U.S. ever inherited such a massive amount of debt, nor a dire economic environment without even making it to adulthood, nor with a political backdrop so hostile allowing you to fix it. Because whether you believe it or not, most of your generation, most of my generation, do not like the private sector. We do not like it when you succeed. We want to tax the crap out of you and scare investment away because that's going to get the economy going. So even if you wanted to do good, it's pretty bad. So for you, no American dream for you. Unfortunately, the picket fence in the 1940s and the 1950s and driving a nice uh, Edsel does not exist uh, anymore. Now, part two, you're screwed socially and culturally. Uh, this, you may not think too much about. Say, so, well, yeah, okay, economically we got it, but you know, socially, how are we particularly screwed? Well, that's true, but think about this. You don't derive happiness and joy from fulfilling lives looking at economic data and charts. Trust me, I know, I do it for a living. I don't say, oh dear, look at my awesome chart, Dennis, dear, that's fine, I'll go away. Um, so, but what you do derive happiness and joy from is the culture that you're in, and what kind of standard, what kind of life you lead within the culture. Unfortunately here, you guys, and my generation as well, but you guys are really getting pummeled in terms of what kind of culture you're going to be inheriting from the United States. But before you go on, we have to ask this question. What is the basic unit or building block of society? 
of all cultures, of all societies, the basic building block, the, the, the cellular level. Family? No, even more, even more fundamental than that. What's a family made of? People. People, right, other humans. You don't just hang out with your family. You got friends, you got co-workers. You got to deal with a lot of people no matter where you go. So the question then becomes this, what do you think happens to our culture and our ability to produce and our everyday quality of life when we go from this to this to this to this? <laughs> and you laugh, but this is your guys' generation. You get to deal with these people. I get to deal with them too, but I mean, you know, okay, we had Kurt Cobain and his wife or whatever. It was really bad music and there was grunge. We did not have zombie protesters or the guy defecating on cop cars. I mean, it, it, and certainly none of us were this. Absolutely none of us. Well, no, maybe some of us personally, but in terms of generation. So there are consequences, primarily a decaying culture. Does any of you know either of these two, Victor Borger or Margaret Cho? No? I'm going to show you. Okay, we'll do Victor Borga first. Let me know if you can't hear it. Can you hear it? I invented a language which I call inflationary language. In inflation, we have numbers rising. The prices go up. Anything that has to do with money goes up. Except the language. See, we have hidden numbers in the world, like one to two, to four. Create, ten billion. All these numbers can be inflated and meet the economy, you know, by rising to the occasion. I suggest we add one to each of these numbers to be prepared. For instance, Wonderful will be two of you. Before you will be five. Create will be nine. Ten dollars will be eleven dollars. Uh, lieutenant will be a little eleven dollars. <laughs> a sentence like I ate a ten dollars and my fourth will be a nine and eleven dollars and my five one. And so on and so forth. <laughs> okay. It's reasonably cute, reasonably clever. Okay, guys, get Victor Borgen, trust me, great date, DVD. He does a lot more other stuff, but... Uh, now, let's go and look at a more modern day comedian, Margaret Cho. I'll eat pussy. It's just not my first choice. I'll eat pussy if they run out of what I really want. No more chicken? Okay, I'll take the pussy. See? Now, wasn't that funny? What? Now, you see what happened. Victor Borg is dead now. They escaped from Nazi Germany or Nazi Europe, rather. And now we got Margaret Cho. Now, what's scary is not so much the crassness and, and the fact that Margaret is uh -huh, uh -huh, pussy, and that's really funny, Margaret. He said people were laughing at that. Like, that was funny. Ha, ha, ha. Whereas something clever like word inflation or um, Victor Borg could play upside down.